Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Kate Boyd and I'm a professor of piano. I'm here to help you take your playing to the next level. Today, I'm going to summarize some of the insights and takeaways from William Westney's book, The Perfect Wrong Note. This book has been on my shelf for many years. And the reason I wanted to talk about it today is because even though it's 20 years old, which I guess makes me old, it still has timeless lessons for piano students and teachers. Before we get started, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. This is one of my favorite books about practicing and playing the piano. And that's why I decided to make my first video in my book series about it. Over the years, this book has become a classic in the piano pedagogy literature. Dr. William Westney is a highly regarded pianist and educator who taught for much of his career at Texas Tech University. In this book, Westney talks a lot about practicing performance anxiety in the student-teacher relationship. Essentially, he argues that the lesson experience can and should be more creatively engaging for the student, and that we need to learn to approach the idea of mistakes in a more self-accepting and honest way. I've come up with five main takeaways from this book that I'm gonna go through with you now. Takeaway number one, traditional music instruction can be stifling. The first key takeaway of this book is the idea that children naturally have an uninhibited and enthusiastic approach to music making, and that the very process of taking music lessons can have the effect of stamping that enthusiasm and joy right out of us. Imagine a child who's uninhibited and free and experiences making music as something just wonderful and creative. Then imagine bringing that child into a piano lesson where they're told to sit still on the bench and face forward. Then the teacher proceeds to instruct the student and the student is inspected to sit without squirming and just take it all in. To do that, they're told to aspire to play perfectly and to that end, they're encouraged to try to shape and control everything in their playing, both physically and musically. What happened to that childlike feeling of play and enthusiasm? What resonates with me is when Westney describes typical high-level piano teaching. In the book, he talks about a time when he went into a lesson and his teacher made him play the same tiny phrase over and over for dozens of times until finally he supposedly got it just right. But of course, the process of him as a student playing it over and over and being told repeatedly, no, that's not it, try again, totally undermined his confidence so that when he finally did get it, he wasn't even sure what he had finally done right. I read that with a flash of guilty recognition. As teachers, it's very easy for us to try to control the student more than try to help the student connect with their own motivations. There's this quote from the book that I just love. It is, much music teaching seems more concerned with controlling the student than with encouraging the student's own impulses. Constant controlling dampens vitality. More often than not, the teacher is well-meaning and just wants to teach the skill and craft of piano playing to a willing student. But that approach, where there's a clear sense of right playing and wrong playing, is going to inadvertently teach feelings of perfectionism and lead to inhibition, both physical and psychological, on the part of the student. What Westney is arguing in this book, however, is that we can relearn that enthusiasm. We can get back in touch with the joy of music making that we have when we were children. And the way to do that is through rethinking what it means to play correctly and incorrectly, and also to reconsider what we mean when we talk about mistakes. Takeaway number two, embrace wrong notes. Wesley spends some time talking about this idea of the mistake and what we even mean when we talk about a mistake. Because using the word mistake implies that one sound at the piano is better than another sound at the piano, when really when we play, we're just producing sounds. The fact that we want certain sounds to be in certain orders and certain dynamics and particular rhythms, that is what makes them right or wrong. But really the act of just playing the piano is not in itself, correct or incorrect. And so the idea of embracing a mistake can be incredibly freeing because instead of thinking, oh no, I made a mistake, and then kind of physically contracting and then feeling this feeling of disappointment in yourself or, or like you somehow come up short, you can instead approach a mistake with gratitude and curiosity because you're getting valuable feedback from that very mistake. You played something on the piano or on your instrument and you got some result. And then you reflect on the result and you think, okay, well, was that the result I wanted? And if not, how can I modify what I do next 
in order to get the result that I do want. So in other words, it's a much more objective approach to playing the piano and it's a much more liberated approach. And I think this book is really good for people who are struggling with perfectionism and self-acceptance at their instrument because perfectionism is something that actually can be quite toxic when you bring that into the practice room or on stage with you. And Wesney addresses that in some detail in this book. I think a lot of the physical tension that we have at the piano simply comes from a fear of mistakes. And so that's the second key takeaway from this book. This idea that you should embrace mistakes, that you can accept them in yourself and then learn from them. Takeaway number three, careless versus honest mistakes. The way we learn things in most situations is through trial and error. When a child learns to walk, they're unsteady on their feet at first and they will fall a lot of times until they figure it out. Playing an instrument is the same as learning any other physical skill. Wesney points out that there is often a totally unreasonable expectation of perfection when learning music in the classical music world. And this doesn't allow us to make honest mistakes as we learn the enormously complicated physical act of playing the piano. An honest mistake is a mistake that happens when you're really focused and present and you're enjoying the, just the physical experience of playing the piano, but you hit a wrong note or you make some kind of mistake. Those are the mistakes that you can really learn from. Westney says, honest mistakes aren't caused by inattention. They're simply what happens when the body is allowed to express itself without restriction. A careless mistake, on the other hand, is a mistake that happens when you're not paying attention and you don't address it when it happens. You might be playing along, but maybe you're thinking about what you're going to do this afternoon or about the email you need to send, and then you make a mistake and you say, oh, well, I, I usually play that right. I know that part. And then you just keep going without reflecting or addressing it or fixing it. That's a careless mistake. And I'll tell you, if you can figure out how to avoid making those careless mistakes, the quality of your practice will skyrocket. This part of the book makes a lot of sense to me because I tell my students that there's no such thing as an accidental mistake. There is no value judgment associated with a mistake. A mistake isn't bad or good. It's just evidence of something that needs closer attention. It's important to take every mistake seriously because a mistake is your body and brain trying to tell you something. Your body is telling you, Actually, you know what? I need a little bit more review on that spot. And that leads us to the fourth takeaway from the book, which is play with gusto. Wesney tells us that if you're going to make a mistake, really make the mistake, really go for it 110%. He calls these juicy mistakes. I love the image of making a big, fat, juicy mistake. Commit to what you're doing. Make the physical motion. Make a strong, vibrant sound. Go for the emotional idea that you want to communicate. And then if you make a mistake, use that as feedback for what to practice next. I think that a tentative sound can result from a fear of making a mistake, a fear of playing the wrong note, playing the wrong finger on a note, or doing something else that is going to get corrected in the lesson. And so I really love the way that Wesney talks about making juicy mistakes and playing with 100% conviction getting results and then going from there. This idea can be confusing for a student because of course we want to avoid making mistakes when we practice. We've been told for years that if we play a wrong note, it'll take longer time to unlearn it and practice in the correct note than if we had just learned it correctly in the first place. But what Wesney is specifically addressing here is that you ultimately want to be fearless and strong when you're performing on stage and you won't get there if your practicing is tentative and cautious. Therefore, the right notes should be the result of confident and decisive movements, not the result of playing it safe hour after hour in your practicing. The fifth takeaway from this book is to trust your intuition. You are the pianist and you are the person with something to express. Be present and be mindful when you practice so that you can be available to tune into and respond to your intuition. Really avoid the temptation to just put in your time and be present only in body but not in spirit because that's worse than not practicing at all. This is the principle behind deliberate practice. As you practice, use your imagination. Think about what sounds you want. How could you move more efficiently? How can you express yourself more authentically? Also, remember, just because something feels intuitive and right one day 
doesn't mean that it always has to be played the same exact way. Wensney uses an example from his own practice. One day, he felt like this Bach minuet that he was playing was somewhat melancholy, and so he wrote the word melancholy in his music because he wanted to remember to play it in a melancholy way. But then the next day, when he was practicing, he saw the note he'd written the day before and tried to play it in a melancholy way, but it didn't feel very authentic to him. That day, he felt like he wanted that passage in the Bach minuet to sound jaunty. And so then he erased melancholy and he wrote jaunty. And then the next day, that jaunty feeling didn't feel authentic to him either. And so the takeaway there is trust your intuition. Know that when you know a piece, you can play it different ways and it can be different on different days as long as the expression is coming from a place of authenticity. And by the way, when you trust your intuition, you'll also stop trying to micromanage every single movement you make. If you are micromanaging and trying to control exactly how you play the piano on every single note, and you tell yourself there's only one right way, then you're really setting yourself up for a tremendous amount of physical inhibition. Wesney writes, perfectionistic expectations lead to detachment from one's body and a tendency to apologize preemptively for one's efforts, knowing from experience that there's sure to be something wrong with them. So instead, be mindful, be present, show up with curiosity. Come to the practice room with an open mind and self-acceptance. That is something I think so many musicians struggle with, including myself. And so consider it a step on a journey rather than a destination. The great thing about this book is that even though it's written by a music teacher and read a lot by music teachers as well, it'll appeal to any serious student of the piano. I didn't even get into his chapter about performing and performance anxiety, which is really insightful and helpful. He even has a chapter about adult learners and a couple of chapters geared t specifically towards teachers. He describes his creative twist on the master class, which he calls the unmaster class. He talks about how to bring more creative ideas into your teaching, which you can actually adapt to your practicing, even if you are reading this book as a student of the piano rather than as a teacher. In The Perfect Wrong Note, Wesley talks a lot about the mental and emotional sides of practicing. A key aspect to effective practicing is engaging the mind and imagination as you practice. I made a video about mental practice, and I'll link to it right up there. Go ahead and click right there to continue. I'll see you in the next video and happy practicing.